Phil Harding. I'm a independent music producer. I'm going to take you through a journey on my years working at PWL Studios in the 80s with Stock Aiken and Waterman and we're going to start that journey in 1984 at which point we were still at the Marquee Studios in Soho, London where I'd been engineering for a good five or six years. I'd been there since 1973 as an apprentice assistant working with lots of big acts in the late 70s and I knew Pete Waterman quite well and he teamed up with Stock and Aiken and in fact a guy called Pete Ware somewhere early 1984 and they came into the marquee with a record that had been mainly recorded at Mike Stock studio so I mixed this record you've probably never heard it before it's called The Upstroke by Agents on Aeroplanes <laughs>
Those of you out there that are familiar with early 80s records will clearly hear that that was an attempt to do a Frankie Goes to Hollywood, kind of a relaxed type groove and <laughs> bass line. And if you were to look up Agents on Aeroplanes on the internet, you would see that even the record cover was similar to a Frankie record cover. So interestingly, credits on that were written by Mike Stock, Matt Aitken and Pete Ware, directed by Mike Stock, Matt Aitken and Pete Ware, and produced by Pete Waterman. It got to number 93 in the UK charts, and the idea of those credits was that Pete had in his mind that he wanted to change the credits of the music industry to be more like the film industry, where the director on the set is a bit like the producer in a music studio. It didn't work because the problem was that when the credits appeared in Music Week, which was very important in the music industry, it only said produced by Pete Waterman and nothing about production by Mike Stock, Mike Aiken and Pete Ware. So that changed pretty quickly. But the one supporter of that record on Radio 1 was John Pill. He played the record quite a bit and helped it to reach those giddy heights. And I'll keep mentioning the chart positions because you'll see there's a general rise. Even in this first year, 1984, the next record that came along that I mixed for Stock Aiken Wallerman and Pete Ware was still part of the team at the time. The same record label, these first three records that I'm playing you, all were on Proto Records, run by Barry Evangeli, and Pete Waterman had his office based in the same offices that they were in, in Kentish Town. So it was a big thing, that relationship between Proto and Pete at that time. And Barry signed a drag queen called Divine, who was quite well known on the club scene, certainly the gay club scene, and had appeared in movies and so on. And a fantastic song called You Think You're a Man. Here it comes. Find me 
Yeah. Divine, you think you're a man. An outrageous Top of the Pops performance where he was in full drag costume, really got everybody talking and helped the record to get to number 16 in the UK charts in 1984. The song was written by Jeff Dean, formerly of Modern Romance. And once again, the strange credits of directed by Matt Aitken, Mike Stock, Pete Ware, produced by Barry Evangeli and Pete Waterman. This was definitely to change. One of the loudest seven-inch vinyl cuts I'd ever experienced. I went with Pete Waterman to Pi Studios to a well-known cutting engineer, Malcolm Davis, who used to work for the Beatles at their Apple Studios. And Pete said to Malcolm, we want this to jump out of Radio 1. We want it to absolutely cut through. And I've never before that or since that experienced a louder seven-inch vinyl. Now, we're building up through 84 into 85 with definitely what was called a high-energy sound, which was big in the gay clubs across the UK and Europe. It was very much underground, and something that Pete Waterman was very good at doing was taking something like this underground and bringing it overground, bringing it into the pop charts. And this next record by Hazel Dean, Whatever I Do, Wherever I Go, again on Proto Records, this time written by Stock Aiken Waterman, and we nicknamed Hazel Dean Queen of Peter Beale Studios when we finally moved out of Marquee because she was fantastic to have around. We did lots of records with her and this was her first big Doc Aiken Waterman breakthrough.
Yeah, the queen of PWL Studios. Even though we hadn't got there yet, we were still at the marquee. That was Hazel Dean, Whatever I Do, Wherever I Go. Engineered and mixed by George Chambers at the Marquee Studios. This was the point where Pete Ware left the team. So again, it, the credits were directed by Mike Stock and Matt Aitken, produced by Pete Waterman. I'm sure that changes soon. And something that really made a big difference to that record and the record before Divine was the purchase of the Fairlight Mega Sampler Machine. You could sample a voice or anything and replay it. And this was used a lot by Trevor Horn and is featured on the Frankie records and lots of his records going forward. So we're definitely getting a nice incline. We started at number 93 for the chart position of Agents on Aeroplanes. Divine peaked at number 16, and that Hazel Dean record peaked at number 4. And the reason I wasn't involved in that is because I was over in America at the time, actually recording with the fantastic guitarist Gary Moore. No longer with us, unfortunately, but I recorded and mixed his single Empty Rooms. So here we go to finish the first section of this show. Dead or Alive, You Spin Me Round. Still sounds great in the clubs as far as I'm concerned. A Dead or Alive song. It was one of four songs that they arrived at the marquee with. The equipment that we had by that time, apart from the Fairlight, we had a PPG Wave, Yamaha Sims, the Lynn drum machine. You know, we were really building an arsenal of fantastic technology and sounds that would go forward from there. And that was the peak, I would say, of the high energy sound of Stock Aiken Waterman and PWL Studios. We'd come back to it, we'd revisit it, but it was a number one record, March of 3rd, 85, but it was released in 84. So for me, it's a great memory. The story's been told many times by Pete Waterman and myself. It was the longest mix I've ever done in my life, 36 hours. We finished day one with a lot of arguments going on in the, in the studio between the band and Mike Stock and Matt Aitken, with Mike and Matt feeling, we've got enough on the record, let's get into the mix. The band feeling they still wanted to do more overdubs. And from my point of view, thank God Pete Waterman arrived something like seven or eight o'clock in the evening and, and basically sent everybody home. Said, Phil, you stay there, mate. We're going to mix this. Everybody else go home. We'll see you in the morning. And that was it. Having had a day of a lot of recording and finishing off the final bits, I did feel it was ready for mixing, but normally a mix engineer like myself would want to come back fresh the next day. But there we were, a heavy night's mixing, where we actually mixed the extended version eight minutes long first, and we edited down that radio version. So we're going to peak at number one with the one and only Dead or Alive, You Spin Me Round.
time, Phil Hardy, talking about the 1980s, PWL and Stock Aiken Waterman. So I've given you some, well, I hope you think are great examples of 1984 when I started working with Stock Aiken Waterman. And all of that work we've heard so far was done at the Marquee Studios in London's West End, where I was an in-house engineer. And after getting that number one with Spin Me Round for Dead or Alive, Pete Waterman, Mike Stock, Matt Aiken decided it's time for us to move out of this studio and to move into our own facility. So Pete Waterman found something in South London it used to be called the Vineyard Studios. It was in the Vineyard, around the back of the Borough Tube Station. And it was an old electric power station that someone else had already converted into a studio. And it was perfect. We moved into the first floor upstairs space, built a wonderful studio, built around the SSL console. And funnily enough, the phone dried up a little bit after not just the number one with Dead or Alive, but a very successful second album for them, the Youthquake album, which charted well. And quite a few different things began to happen. So I'm going to kick off again with a record you may not have heard before, unless you're a mega PWL fan. This is a cover of the James Brown classic, It's a Man's 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 World by Brilliant. man's man's world <laughs> brilliant were made up of jimmy Corty, youth and june montana on vocals there and the reason i played that record is twofold really in the background there singing back her vocals was a session vocalist called desiree she went on to become princess which i'm going to play next but 
The other point for people not knowing much about Brilliant and talking about it is that Jimmy Corti and their A&R man at the record company, Bill Drummond, went on to become KLF, who had huge amount of hits further on in the 80s and have publicly admitted they learned a lot of their trade from working with us at PWL through this album. And a guy called Youth, who I'd come across before. Youth was a bass player with the band Killing Joke. I engineered their first album in 1980. And Youth has since brilliant gone on to become a worldwide famous record producer, producing Paul McCartney and and all kinds of big names. I still come across Youth now and again when uh, I'm out and about in London. (laughs) So we're moving on. The next record I'm playing you is Princess Say I'm Your Number One. It was interesting on the brilliant sessions that Desiree, Mike and Pete and Matt got talking, got chatting. In particular, Mike Stock was keen to move away from continually doing covers of other people's songs. Really wanted to sort of stamp the authority of Stock Aiken Waterman being songwriters. And bringing someone like Desiree in was really the start of that going forward from that point. And I played you the four songs from the first part, three of them on Proto Records. And there was a fantastic promotion guy there called Nick East, who had come to Pete in 85 and said, look, I'm thinking of starting my own label. 
Pete immediately said, this is a great idea, Nick. I can give you office space, we can give you artists, we can give you the records, come in with us. So before PWL Records, there was the label that Nick E started, which was Supreme Records. And this wasn't the first collaboration between Nick E, Supreme Records and Stock Aiken Waterman. It would build on from there. But interestingly, that brilliant record got to number 58 in the charts in 85. Desiree, or Princess, would say I'm your number one, number seven. And it really set the platform for the whole team going forward. One of the things that stuck in my mind is that Pete Waterman actually went on holiday the week the record was made. But with clear plans and instructions to Mike, Matt and myself, what he wanted from this record, the kind of groove. The two records I've just played, nothing like the high energy gay club sound of the first four records, which as I said, we come back to. But when people talk about the PWL sound, Princess, say I'm your number one, Dead or Alive spin me round, they are nothing like each other. So, forward we went into 1986, and the next record I'm playing you is an absolute smash. A great story behind it. It's Venus by Bananarama. She's got it. Venus by Banana Armor. A number eight UK hit, but significantly a number one USA hit, pop charts and the dance charts. And after we made that record, Pete Waterman opened up the whole building, all of the studios that we had at that point. Already, a couple of years on, we'd gone from one studio to three studios because the building was big enough to take it. 
and an industry party celebrating their first, certainly not their last, American number one. A fantastic achievement and feat. It was interesting when we started that record, obviously that's a cover of an old 60s track, and it was done kind of in a modern hats off, keeping that guitar and making it sound like a straight ahead pop record. And we'd got to the point where we were doing the mix. I have this funny memory of myself and Matt Aitken pulling the mix together. Everyone else had gone around the pub. We had a tradition of going around to the pub at 10 o'clock. Pete Waterman would say, tools down. Banana Armour were one of the acts that used to come around the pub with us. For some reason, Matt and I got left behind. We were kind of in the middle of the mix and Siobhan out of Banana Armour put her head around the corner and said, you know what, actually we didn't want it to sound like that. We wanted it to sound like Dead or Alive. Matt and I looked at each other and thought, what? <laughs> Why did you say that at the beginning of the record? And she was dead serious. So it was down tools at that point. Out came the drum machine and some keyboards again. And Matt quite rightly said, OK, fair enough, we can do that. And it was the same when Pete Burns had a Dead or Alive turned up. And I don't know which one of us it was that said to him, why are you here with us, Pete? And he said, well, I've been hearing your Hazel Dean and your Divine Records in all the clubs I go to in Liverpool and persuaded my record company, who were quite against coming to Stock Aiken Waterman, CBS Records, a massive company. But he was determined. He said, no, this is the sound we want for Dead or Alive, the sound I want, and that's where we're going. This would happen time and time again. Anyway, we've moved on to 1986 and going back to Supreme Records and that relationship I was talking about. After the Princess hits, Nick East signed a couple of young girls from the East End, Mel and Kim, the Applebee's, and we made this first record showing out. There's lots of stories about how some of the Stock Aiken Waterman songs came about. And one of the ones for that was asking one of the assistants, Jamie, and I think it was one of the girls that asked him, I'm not really sure, because we'd already made a record with them before this showing out. And then Pete Waterman put it on hold and said, no, we're going to make a new record based around this new Chicago house sound that's coming. But anyway, they're asking, oh, what are you doing at the weekend, Jamie? Oh, I'm showing out. Mike Stott looked at Matt Aitken and <laughs> on it went from there. But basically, this is 1986 and the Chicago house sound had arrived in the clubs. And because of Banana Armour, we had a good relationship going on with DJ Pete Tong. would come in with records, usually leading up to the weekend, and would hand them over to Pete Waterman and say, this record's really going to be happening this week. The Chicago House, it was a sound of a number of records coming together. So the idea was, let's forget this first record that was called System, that had been recorded and was already pressed and ready to release with Mel and Kim, and make a new record based around the Chicago House sound and 120 BPM or just above that sometimes and this formed the kind of house club pop sound of PWL and SAW going forward for quite a few years. So it's Mel and Kim showing out. <laughs>
Welcome back to this special with me, Phil Harding, talking about my journey through the 80s with Stock Aiken Walderman and PWL Studios. We're moving on to 1987. I've split this up quite deliberately into a chronological set of years because that's how my memory works, that's how my brain works, and that's how I've written my book, PWL from the Factory Floor. That's available on my website, philhardingmusic.com. So if you'd like to find out more, then please go to my website and make an order. 87 was, for me, a fantastic creative year at PWL. I'd formed a new production and remix partnership with my good friend Ian Kerno. He had joined in 1986 and Pete had expanded the studios. So I had my own studio, the Bunker Studio, and there was a sub-bunker studio below that where Ian came in and started running the Fairlight that I talked about before. And we really did begin to have a run of great dance records, pop records, crossing over in all sorts of places. So this one's a good example of that. The former backing singers and dancers to Wham, Pepsi and Shirley, this is Heartache. Yeah, reached number two in the UK charts, Heartache. That was a radio edit of the 12-inch mix that Ian Kerno and I did. One of many mixes and productions that we got into 1987 onwards. And I used to go out to the New York Seminar. That was a dance music conference in the 80s. And I went to a gay club out there one evening. And we must have had a run of something like five or six records that the DJ put together. Absolutely fantastic. And it peaked with the Pepsi and Shirley Heartache there. 
So possibly the end of 85, this young lad arrived at the studio. I'm talking about Rick Astley. Pete introduced him as our next assistant T-boy, and he was on a YTS scheme. Pete, we later found out, had seen him playing drums and singing in a band up in Warrington and persuaded Rick to come down to London and to spend some time at the studio. But interestingly, apart from Stock and Aiken, he didn't tell everybody else that. He just said, this is Rick, new T-boy. Let him know how you like your tea. Milk, no sugar, please, Rick. (laughs) And, uh, and some months later, he said to myself and Ian, can Rick come down to your room and take a look at some of his ideas? Why don't you co-write some songs with him, get him into the flow of, of, of what we're doing here? So we did quite a few songs with Rick, and we had a release with Rick and Lisa as a duet called When You're Gonna that came out on RCA Records. And this next track, which we all know and hopefully love, was actually sitting on the shelf for nearly six months. And the version I'm going to play you now is an example of how a record builds up from maybe the first version or the second version. And Pete Waterman wasn't convinced by this version I'm about to play you, which I mixed, decided that it needed strings and brass and some more development, which he and Kerno helped with. And we finished up with Never Gonna Give You Up, Rick Astley. what a guy we all became really friendly with Rick because of the way that he came into the studio and one of my little stories that I like to relay is that in 1986 Rick came to my stag do which was in an East London pub across the road from the flat that I lived in and I managed to persuade the landlord to let us stay after hours 
There was a typical sort of East End pub, piano and a drum kit and a little PA in the corner. And Rick was playing drums at my stag do. There you go. <laughs> number one, all around the world, and number one in America. Just incredible. I mean, if things hadn't risen to a fantastic amount of hits and number ones, etc., etc., this really set a new high and a new standard for Stock Aiken Waterman and PWL. It wasn't on PWL Records. It was a license to RCA Records. And we went on and had another album with Rick, and I'm going to play you a track from that second album. It was difficult for Rick. as a solo artist going out and promoting this number one record, and the follow-ups were number ones as well off this first album. On his own, a lot of pressure, huge amount of pressure. Ian and I recorded possibly the last two tracks for Rick's first album, and when he came to do the vocal sessions, it was a real struggle, just because he was exhausted from travelling to America and Germany and Japan, and people don't realise what hard work it is promoting records. It's fantastic to have success, but that's why we see some artists not lasting the course. Okay, moving on to a fantastic act that Ian and I really got on well with. This is an act called Blue Mercedes and a record called I Want To Be Your Property. Therese, I Want to Be Your Property by Blue Mercedes. <laughs> Ian and I had fantastic fun with the two guys, David Titlow and Miller. They were great. We did a whole album with them and they were good fun to work with. And I'm surprised they weren't bigger, but they were very popular in America in the dance charts. Although it only got to number 23, that track in the UK charts. Ian and I were delighted. 
But we're rounding off 87 with another number one. OK, this time it's only a remix, but it really did help this record in the clubs. And it started, or reignited, I should say, a relationship with the Pet Shop Boys, who I'd worked with before. I'd co-produced a track called In The Night back in 85 when we started at PWL. And that was the B-side to Opportunities but it went on to become the soundtrack for the fashion show on TV. So their manager, Tom Watkins, who Ian and I did a lot of work with in the 90s, came to us and said, guys, you're the hot remixers in the clubs at the moment. We're aiming for number one for Christmas. And so this is the Harding Kerno remix of Always On My Mind, Pet Shop Boys.
Phil Harding talking about the 1980s PWL and Stock Aiken Waterman. And so far, I've taken you through 84 to 87. And as we hit 1988, a major change, a new star arrives. I'm talking about Kylie Minogue. She arrived in 87. She took a week out from filming her Neighbours show that she was on. None of us working at the studio knew anything about Neighbours. Our work schedule would be 10 a.m. through to 10 p.m. So we certainly didn't have time to watch TV when Neighbours was on at 5 p.m. And she'd taken a week out to come over and record with Stock Aiken Waterman. The best way I can describe it is that by that time we were so busy three studios running, a whiteboard up in the main studio with any number of projects on. So the week Kylie arrived, there was probably a list of Sam Fox up there, Banana Armour, Rick, etc, etc. And Pete Waterman really was the captain of the ship. There'd be a morning meeting, Pete would decide or relay to Mike and Matt what was going on, what the priorities were, and throughout a day, sometimes depending on who was coming in, what was on the tape machine and what was being worked on could be three or more different projects in a day. So for some reason, Pete Waterman, possibly thinking he's already got the boys under too much pressure, failed to let them know that Kylie was arriving to record with them. They hadn't got anything prepared at the start of the week and ready for her. We'd grown from a staff of, let's say, five or six people in 1985. Here we are in 1987, towards the end. We had quite a large amount of staff in the building by that time. The publishing company, a lot of admin people, as well as all of the creatives. And we would gather quite regularly in the reception area to celebrate somebody's birthday or to celebrate another hit record and it was on one of those occasions during that week when Kylie was there that I first met her we were drinking champagne and eating cake and she was sitting in the corner of the room and no one was talking to her I didn't know who she was so I went over and said hi told her who I was and she introduced herself and said that she was here to make a record with Mike and Matt and I wished her well Come the Friday of that week, and there are various versions of this story, but certainly what I've been told is that Peter disappeared for the weekend, as he often did on a Friday, because he still lived up in Warrington, up north. And the managing director, David Howes, had had Kylie and her manager doing all of the touristy things around London for the best part of the week and saying each day, Oh, I'm sure they're going to get you in the studio, um, you know, it'll be tomorrow. Go off to the Tower of London and, you know, one of our drivers will take them around. So come Friday morning, both Kylie and her manager were getting quite stressed and concerned that she was getting on a plane in the afternoon and still nothing had been recorded. So there was an unwritten rule that David Howes was basically not allowed into the studio, into the control rooms for various reasons. But he had to go in, he had to point out to Mike and Matt that today had to be the day a deal had been struck. And I wasn't in the room. I'm told that quite a few people came in and talked about it. They tried to get hold of Pete on the phone. And we had a fantastic club promoter called Pit Stop who was our own promoter by that time, going out to the clubs. And a conversation, something along the lines of, well, we've got nothing written for her and maybe we could pull something off the shelf. And it's renowned that Pit Stop said, well, she should be so lucky to have something you've got on the shelf, guys. At which point, <laughs> another light bulb for Mike Stock looked at Matt Aitken. Oh, that's an idea. And they set about writing the song there and then. Obviously, the song hadn't been written. So Kylie came into the studio and section by section, as they were writing it, they'd get Kylie in to record it. So let's record a verse, let's record some chorus, then the next verse, etc. And I'm told that by the time Kylie left to get her plane at the end of the day, she had no idea or concept of how the song actually sounded. So here it is, Kylie Minogue, I Should Be So Lucky.
January 88, that hit number one in the UK. It took off around Europe, didn't really do well in America. A couple of Kylie records did after that. But what a fantastic start to her career. But it really was, I often say to people, and it's in my book, PWL from the Factory Floor, that it was the end of a creative period for us coming out of 87 because Kylie became so big and Pete Waterman formed his own record label, PWL Records, saying that no one was prepared to sign Kylie. It sounds crazy, but the other labels weren't interested. And suddenly, what he actually named as PWL Empire at the start of the whole process, this was the last brick, as it were, in the building of the empire by, rather than working for outside record labels, suddenly you had your own label. So you've got your own production team, your own songwriting team, your own publishing, your own label. And it really was a fantastic ride from here on. But in my humble view, creatively, we went a little bit downhill and a bit too pop. But aside from that, myself and Ian Kerno, uh, sometimes called the SAWB team, we had our own studio set up further down in the building. And by this point in 88, we'd done a couple of remixes for the Pet Shop Boys, formed quite a good relationship with their manager, Tom Watkins. And Tom phoned one day and said, we're looking at making a record with Eighth Wonder and Patsy Kensett. And it's a song that the Pet Shop Boys had written. And they'd like to come over to PWL and co-produce it with yourself and Ian. So we'd just come out of another remix with them. And literally on the same week in they came to make this record. Very proud of this one. I'm Not Scared by Eighth Wonder.
Katie Kensit, as we know, went on to be a very well-known actress and she's still around on the scene, as it were, but no longer making records. But that was good fun, making that with her and the Pet Shop Boys. So Ian and I were on a fantastic run of lots of remixes and club remixes at this point, and Pete Waterman managed to negotiate a couple of major remixes, one of which I'm going to play you next, where the record companies were willing to send the original multi-tracks to us because Pete had earned their trust. So that happened with some of the tracks from the Grease movie, and we did the Grease Mega Mix, Olivia Newton-John and John Travolta. That was interesting hearing their multi-tracks. But even more exciting was that Pete did a deal with Tamla Motown and almost gave us the choice of what tracks would we like to remix in a current groove and mode. So this is the 88 remix from myself and Ian Kerno, Michael Jackson and the Jackson 5, I Want You Back. hear the fun that we had on that having all of those vocals separated for us and to play with with our samplers it was a great honor but interestingly the multi-track arrived 16 individual tracks eight of those had all the music on guitars drums etc backing vocals and at some point it must have been transferred from eight track to 16 track because tracks nine to 16 were all michael 
<laughs> I had to recompile Michael's lead vocal from a choice of eight takes. So that was interesting. <laughs> anyway, at this point in time, back at PWL, Pete's trying to persuade, quite rightly, Rick Astley to come back in and do a second album with us contract was there the deal was done everybody was waiting and quite desperate for his next album and his next material there'd been four singles off the first album and he came into the studio to record a song called nothing can divide us which they had written for rick and there was a buzz around the building when big stars came back in and although we all knew rick really well there was always a buzz if debbie harry came in once we did a whole album with donna summer which i'm playing track from later on People were excited. There was a vibe in the building. Oh, Rick's back in. He started album two. And somewhere around five o'clock, I had gone out to reception and Rick was coming down the stairs at pace, didn't look happy, didn't really communicate and stormed out the building. To which lots of raised eyebrows, lots of worried people. And the long and the short of it is that he didn't like the song. As we all know now, it got passed on to Jason Donovan. But it was originally written for Rick. He felt it was too poppy. He felt the key was too high. And basically said to Pete Waterman, look, I'm writing my own songs now. I want to do my own thing. Put me in a studio with someone else to give that a go. So Pete Waterman said to myself and Ian Kerno, look, we really ideally want to keep Rick on board. Will you go down to the workroom studios in Elephant Castle that he had just purchased and co-produce with Rick a couple of his own songs? And the feeling was that we had quite a lot of freedom to do whatever we wanted, bring in extra musicians, make it less programmed, etc., etc. So that's what we did initially. So normally the basses would come from synthesizers and be programmed, but we brought a live bass player in, Felix Krish. We had Robert away on guitar, who'd played with Wham and lots of soul bands. The Lewis sisters singing backing vocals. And Rick had written this song called She Wants to Dance With Me. And it came out slightly different to this. So I'm playing you a version that's not very often heard. And we call it the original R&B version with the live bass.
alongside Phil Harding, talking about the 1980s, PWL and Stock Aiken Waterman. This guy needs no introduction. Number one in March 1989, the second arrival from Australia from the Neighbours show, as we all know, Jason Donovan. I believe that was his second hit. And I've got in front of me the credit of these types of records that went out from PWL. And it's worth just mentioning a few people because it all goes to making up that sound. And there's a very unique backing vocal sound behind most of the Stock Aiken Waterman records. And the credits on that one you just heard, May McKenna, Mike Stock, Miriam Stockley. And May and Miriam were just absolute stalwarts, you know, fantastic sound, fantastic blend. But actually on many of the records I've played during this show, Mike Stock is doing backing vocals on the Brilliant record, on the Dead or Alive record, and not something he particularly talks about. Engineered by the wonderful Karen Hewitt, we got her in from Australia, Yo-Yo, Guitars there by Matt Aitken, he's a fantastic guitarist, people uh, don't really understand that much, that major contribution, wherever you hear guitars on Peter O'Yell records, mixed by Pete Hammond. Extra keyboards by George DeAngelis. He's gone on to do a lot of Hollywood music scripts and things like that out there. So, 89, PWL Records. You've had Kylie moving on to her second album. We're going to play a track from that next. You've got Jason Arrived. And I think it was 89 was the year that we had something like 40% of the singles charts for the year. And I remember going to a conference in 1990 and an executive from an American label almost complaining to his people that who are these PWL records independent label independent distribution outdoing us in the UK charts what's going on 
Well, come album two with Kylie, Pete asked me to get a bit more involved. I wasn't very involved in album one. This was the start of the move back to trying to regain what had been kind of lost in the clubs and the club audience that we had pre-Kylie and Jason arriving. And I remember mixing this track, and this is how fast we could turn things around. The following week, when I was driving out to the countryside with my family on a Friday evening, escaping London, and on it came on Capital Radio. And I really thought, yeah, I enjoyed doing that mix, and boy, does it sound good on the radio. Hope it still sounds good now. Hand on Your Heart by Kylie Minogue. Put your hand on your heart and tell me that we're through. One of our favourite artists, even though I might have been detrimental to the effect overall of the output of PWL, but she was fantastic, so professional to work with. I had the great opportunity to write a song with her, with Ian Kerno, and in fact we produced one of the last recordings before we left PWL for her first greatest hits album, her version of Celebration. So the tremendous thing in 1989 is that a young girl in Liverpool could go up to Pete Waterman after doing his radio show there, which he did every Saturday morning, and hand him cassettes, which I believe she did week in, week out, until it got to the point where she was bugging him so much, he listened to one of the cassettes, liked her voice, 
invited her down to London. The boys had written a track especially for her. You know, they would always discuss the artists that they're writing for lyrically before writing the song so that hopefully it was aimed directly for and at the artists themselves. And it was an eye-opener to me because when I was doing this mix, Pete described meeting this girl, bringing her down. We'd all met her. She fitted in fantastically, made the record, and the record went to number one. Wow, it really felt like we could almost do anything riding on the crest of the wave. You'll never stop me from loving you, Sonia. That was a fantastic record. Plenty of people criticised it, criticised Sonia, but that first album that she did with us at PWL, Ian and I went on and wrote some songs and produced tracks for it. And in fact, when we left in the early 90s and Simon Cowell signed her to his label, we did a few records with her there. And she's back in the limelight, Eurovision coming up. The liver puddly and bubbly, fantastic girl that she is. It's great to see her featured back in major media. So we're going to finish 1989. By the way, those last three records, all number one throughout 1989. And the exciting thing earlier in the year was that Donna Summer arrived, not just to do one track, but to do a whole album, not to do covers, but to do Stock Aiken Waterman songs and songs that she co-wrote with them. And a couple of fantastic comeback singles had made the album a big success. And I got to remix this one, Love's About to Change My Heart. I mean, it was an absolute honour for everybody to be working with her and she really enjoyed it. I think she was possibly a little hesitant about coming over and working with producers and writers that were so pop orientated. But boy, did it relaunch her career. Wow. Donna Summer, Love's About to Change My Heart. I never needed someone 
Phil Harding with you here, talking about the 1980s, and I've talked a lot about Stock Aiken Wallerman, PWL Studios, Ian Kerno, all the people I've worked with, a lot of the artists that we've worked with and that I've played the tracks for, and it's worth mentioning that I've written my book talking about my journey through the 80s with Stock Aiken Wallerman and PWL Studios, called PWL From The Factory Floor, available on my website, philhardingmusic.com. And we did lots of hits for Sunita, for Big Fun, Samantha Fox. Two albums with Dead or Alive. This is a tremendous amount of work across a fairly short period of time. Some unlikely collaborations with Zig Zig Sputnik, a record with Malcolm McLaren, Jermaine Stewart, Debbie Harry, and the list goes on and on. And I haven't even mentioned the famous duet by Kylie and Jason, especially for you. Open up any kind of greeting card and there's the title. Okay, we're into our last section. (laughs) And we're into 1990. I'm taking you 1990 into 91. And myself and Ian left at the start of 92. Unfortunately, Matt Aitken and Pete Hammond left somewhere around 91. We were kind of still riding high, but only just about. It's almost like the decade of the 1980s finished and there was a real feeling in the media and culturally that things needed to change. 
and certainly the club scene was changing. Our house had turned into Acid House. Our version of Chicago House might have been called London House. Generally, what we might call the general PWL sound seemed to be in a downward spiral. And it kind of made us try, shall we say, even harder to bring back that club audience that we lost, I feel, just after 87, and to really get back into the club. So this first record I'm going to play was a very blatant attempt to do that, and it worked. Lonnie Gordon, happening all over again, got to number four in the UK charts in January 1990 and reunited us with the Supreme Record label. What a voice. It was like having Donna Summer back in the studio, back in front of me on my mixing desk and faders. A real pleasure to work with. And that did well for us. That got us back up to number four in January 1990. And a few tracks were made after that with Lonnie, but for some reason, no other big hits. It was a good time still in 1990. We had a big concert at the Albert Hall to celebrate with lots of the artists we'd worked with. And we were getting back into the club, so that was beginning to succeed for Pete. And this next record is another great example of that. From Kylie's third album, Step Back in Time.
the sound of a bright young future, the look of a bright young Britain. They're all kind of slogans that went around PWL. For me, that's one of the favourite tracks that I worked on with Kylie and that kind of retro club sound allowed us to get really into those funky club samples and brass and the beats and that's a wonderful track. And they matched her image to it really well, I thought, at the time. So that got to number four in November 1990 and as I was saying, we were kind of struggling to stay with it in the early 90s and pretty soon after this, a few people started leaving. The work that was coming in for myself and Ian Kerno was largely sourced from outside, you know, other labels that wanted us to commercialise maybe the sound of something that wasn't quite right for radio. And a really good example of that is the work that we did with Jesus Jones, who were kind of a thrashy rock band at the time and had a good following, but hadn't hit the charts, hadn't really been supported by radio. So the label came to us with this song, International Bright Young Thing, and said, we need it radio friendly. What can you do, guys? So this was it. Jesus Jones, International Bright Young Thing. Jesus Jones, I don't think they sounded anything like that live, but by the time we'd kind of funked it up a little bit with our drum programming and a slightly different groove, it surprisingly worked well with all their wacky guitar sounds and really fantastic vocals. Really loved the vocalist. If you listen to the 12 inch versions of, of all the stuff that I've played today, we'll start with just a drum beat that DJs can mix into and we'll finish with a drum beat. Some simple ideas that really made things work in the clubs. We're going to round off the show with another guitar bass band. This is Voice of the Beehive and their cover of the Partridge Family's I Think I Love You. This got to 25 in September 91 and I left PWL in February of 92 with Ian Kerno and we moved on to the Strongroom Studios, based ourselves there as a production team and we went on to work with E17, Boyzone and a lot of those boy bands from the 1990s. 
So maybe I should be back sometime for a 1990 special. I'll see you then. <laughs>